Okay. Hey everyone, welcome to Zero to Hero Achieving Supply Chain Security on a Shoestring Budget. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a different talk, but before we say anything, we want to make sure you know it is not a vendor talk. We're not trying to sell you something, and that's done very purposely, but we are going to talk a little bit about what exactly Bugcrowd is and why we go and do the depths of what we actually do. So full disclosure, Bugcrowd is basically a crowdsourced security platform, which basically means that we take epic individuals like yourself from our security community and put them in touch with our customers. And then we basically get them to submit some awesome bugs and get paid for it. So if you actually think about it, it's basically Linus's law personified. Uh, if you've heard of Linus's law, it's literally, um, you know, given enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. And it's literally taking that entire concept and bringing it into a platform. Um, but enough about Bugcrowd. <laughs> Today, we actually thought it would be really fun to go and uh, basically introduce each other because, you know, we'll get a little bit of each other's thoughts in there. Um, so this is Ben. He's humongously tall, and I'm a puny little guy. Uh, he's a junior security engineer. He is a bug crowder and an avid, you know, epically uh, awesome security engineer. So he actually does some really, really epic tasks in bug crowd. Uh, he's on the purple team, so he's both an attacker and a defender, and we like to call them the true purple team. So apologies for anyone out there who doesn't agree with us, but um, basically, uh, he's also the ex-president of the UTS Cybersecurity Society and, uh, and currently is the partnership director, so he's doing all of that while working full-time, which is a pretty epic you know, initiative. He's a computer science student and he actually wants to steal my job and my salary, uh, but he recently found out uh, what I actually do for a living. Do you still want to steal my job, mate? No, I saw, um, I saw Sada's calendar um, and holy moly, the amount of meetings, so I'm very happy in the, in the technical side of things. Um, but of course, I'd love to introduce my... My good friend, Sajib, um, he's fantastic. He's the global head uh, director of cybersecurity at BugCrowd. Uh, he's a fantastic purple team leader. I have to say that for the sake of my employment. Um, but he is, <laughs> um, in his spare time, he's an adjunct uh, lecturer at the University of Melbourne. So if you're fortunate enough to go there, uh, do sign up for his web security masters. From what I heard, it is a fantastic course. Um, he is a security researcher, so he does do bug bounties. Um, and he is an ex-pen tester. Um, he loves to learn. Uh, and maybe a little bit of a sometimes annoying he loves automation to the point that if, even if it's quicker manually, he'll still automate it and he'll find a way to do it. So we have a fantastic um, talk lined up for you today. If you haven't heard of supply chain security before, we're going to be talking about that um, and then going into identification um, of risks as well as classifying those risks, uh, different attacks, and also what to do uh, in the case that everything goes wrong, so some incident response, uh, as well as some leadership tips. Um, so actually, you know, how do you present you know, getting some kind of supply chain initiatives to your board at your company and getting that implemented? So, what is supply chain security? Do you actually know what software you are using in a project? Do you know what software your dependencies use? Um, or maybe you've come to the realization that your dependencies might have dependencies. Um, but you know, you might know this, but you know, going that extra step and making it secure. Uh, but let's actually define what it is. Uh, supply chain security is accounting for and protecting all the software in use for your projects. Um, so this includes you know, different types of languages you're using, software components, uh, third party vendors, uh, all of that included. We are not talking about hardware today, so sorry for all our hardware um, people out there. Uh, but for example, you know, packages that you would get from NPM or maybe PyPy, uh, or even a Docker image uh, that you've gotten from a you know, rep repository like Docker Hub. Um, there are all sorts of things we'll be discussing today. But why should you actually care about supply chain security? And the fact is, if you don't, um, the significance um, of it and the lack of it um, can be catastrophic on your environment. So I've got six reasons um, on why you should care. Uh, and first of all is business continuity. Um, everyone, makes, everyone makes sure that their business is running fine with no hiccups. Um, a breach is not a great way for that. Um, if you're not caring about your supply chain, breaches is absolutely something that could, could happen. If you have a breach down in your supply chain, you know. Uh, let's say a package um, or also gets compromised, their compromise is your compromise as well. Um, of course, it's you know important to have processes um, in place for your supply chain. So for example, getting packages approved, um, making sure that you do have good processes um, to cause no delays in your business. Data protection, we hear about it all the time in cybersecurity. It's a massive thing, that's why we're in it. We're wanting to protect data. Um, and you know, having a strong supply chain and the security of that uh, is paramount to that. Uh, so for example, uh, let's say you know, you've know you gotten a malicious package, um, or you don't know it's a malicious package, you've gotten um, and pulled a malicious package using a Python software project, for example, um, 
and it turns out there are some lines of code it wasn't properly reviewed um, and it's able to you know find your environmental variables and then send that off somewhere and you know if you had your AWS creds in there you know there goes your production API keys etc um, so vulnerabilities can be introduced um, through your supply chain leading to massive data exposures so it's absolutely important to care about it uh, three compliance requirements. Um, we're starting to see that a lot of modern compliance standards are starting to touch on supply chain security. We believe that this is only something that's going to get more important going forward. Uh, so it will allow you to get ahead of the curve if you are starting to look at supply chain now and how you can secure it. Um, and of course, uh, talking about getting ahead, uh, competitive advantages. Again, supply chain security isn't something that is really being discussed too much. It has only really started. Um, so if you are dealing with it now, it is showing that your company is mature and it is giving you know, that confidence uh, in your company, in your organization, with your customers, your clients, and your internal team. And finally, risks or mitigating those risks. Um, it's important that you do control risks within your supply chain. Um, you can set up various technical controls, um, different processes to manage this. Uh, one thing we will be talking about is a software bill of materials later on. Uh, so if you're not sure what that is, uh, we will cover it, but it's a great way to measure exposure and your attack surface. And then of course, third party risks. You know, what happens if a company you rely on holds your data, gets compromised? What do you do in that situation? And that's some other things we'll discuss further on. Fantastic. So looking at some case studies, um, I guess one instance where you know, it did go wrong in the supply chain and the other time where it was fortunately caught. Uh, so a little bit of a trigger warning for anybody from Microsoft, but we are talking about SolarWinds. Um, so uh, SolarWinds, it happened about three years ago. Um, it uh, was essentially SolarWinds. They produced a IT infrastructure management system. It was really popular, about 300,000 customers at the time. Uh, and essentially it did get targeted by a cyber espionage attack. Um, and as a result, hackers did insert malicious code into uh, a software update uh, that was then pushed uh, to about 18,000 people, including Microsoft, uh, the US government, and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, this did provide a backdoor uh, into these companies, um, you know, solid companies like Microsoft. Uh, and this really emphasized that even if, you know, a company's primary software is secure, um, third party software can introduce major vulnerabilities. Um, so definitely, you know, something to keep an eye out on. Um, it was also identified that things like an s bomb would have been really quite helpful in terms of mitigating what went wrong. On the flip side, um, again, not a vendor talk, um, we're talking about something that was found uh, through bug crowds, which is really awesome. Uh, essentially what happened is a hacker, an ethical hacker, will say social engineered uh, an employee account and was able to place uh, some proof of concept code uh, into a Docker image. Uh, this was well within the scope, so nothing you know, unethical here. Uh, but that Docker image uh, was pulled by the customer uh, and unfortunately, there's you no know, you know, hash verification and use. Uh, and this did, as a result, uh, allow the proof of concept code to be run in the production environment, leading to the potential of a full compromise had uh, this not been caught. Um, so fortunately, that was found in bug crowds, the hacker was paid out, um, and the customer was able to fix that issue within 24 hours, which is just fantastic. So, fantastic, we're gonna talk about identification. You, we hear it all the time, you can't protect what you don't know. And I'm just going to briefly talk about what an S bomb is. Now, I had to be very careful reading this slide out in the airport. Um, but a S bomb is a software a bill of uh, materials. It was derived uh, from the bill of materials that is used uh, in construction. Uh, so, essentially, a bill of materials is an inventory of you know raw materials, different components, um, subcomponents. Um, or everything you would need for a construction project. Um, and we've managed to hijack this uh, for software, again, dangerous slide to read in an airport uh, while practicing. Um, and uh, this, uh, yeah, essentially we use it in software and it's a great way to uh, maintain and keep a list of all the different software components you are using in a project, uh, which is fantastic. And I'm gonna briefly talk about transitive dependencies. So if you're not sure what they are, essentially they are dependencies of your dependencies. Uh, so for example, you might have a software project that depends on the Python request package. Uh, that Python request package depends on uh, URL lib3. Uh, and therefore, as a result, URL lib3 is a transitive dependency of your software via the Python request package. So just something to keep in mind because we will be talking about that a little bit further on. Anyway, I'll be now handing it over to Sarge. 
Awesome. Thanks, mate. Uh, so what exactly is the solution to everything we've just given you? We basically just dumped a whole bunch of information, but the reality is how do you actually go and do all of these different things? And what we're actually going to talk to you about today, and the reason why we keep bringing up Bug Crowd, is we're going to tell you how Bug Crowd does it and how we did everything for a very small amount of money. Now, the reason why we did it for a small amount of money is not because Bug Crowd doesn't have money or not because we didn't have money to spend. We did have investment, but the reality was there's so many different vendors out there and there's actually quite a lot going on in the space. But no one's actually doing every single aspect of what we needed. And in other words, basically, we'd have to either spend, you know, $30,000 here, $30,000 there, and screw ourselves over. Or alternatively, we go and consolidate it ourselves and kind of pop in a bit of engineering and ingenuity to make it happen. And that's kind of the way we ended up going. So bug crowds S bomb and the way we implemented things. We went with a bit of custom tooling. So the general thing that most companies end up doing, which is Python 3, a bit of Golang, and basically having a bit of fun with it. We ended up using a lot of different open source projects to be able to go and kind of help facilitate our own um, you know, usage of things. So we actually ended up you know, bringing in parsers and things like that from other places and utilizing it in the best way we can. Uh, that includes you know, if we're literally pulling up something like a Go mod file and trying to actually parse it down and figure out what's going on, there's actually parsers already out there that you can go and utilize. So literally importing those or forking them and then using those bits of code after they're audited to make sure that they're safe for our usage. And it works quite well. Now, the other part of it is um, we're very lucky about Crowd because we are a small company. We're about 10 years old. Um, but the reality is we have epic engineers. where We actually have some of them in the room today, which is awesome. Um, but they basically end up uh, putting all their code in GitHub, which means we have one single source of truth. And I know a lot of other companies basically have it a lot more spread out, which makes it a lot harder for you. So unfortunately, we're going to go with the easy route, which is our route, and basically say that all code is stored in GitHub, which means you can pull it all from GitHub. GitHub API. And that's basically what we ended up doing. We literally just wrote a bunch of different queries uh, for the GitHub API and pulled all the data in, found out exactly where all the different files are located, since you, uh, most files actually do have a common naming format. So something like, say, go mod, you know it's a go, uh, basically, mod file, and you've got everything in there. Same thing for like a rake file and blah, blah, blah. You've got all the different things uh, accordingly. And you can basically then just go and parse each of these different files and utilize them and then create your own report. Now, the way we do our reports is a little bit different. We basically put it all into a Git repo, so it's version controlled. And uh, the reason why we do this, once again, is it all stays in one place and it's nice and easy. But the real good advantage is that it means you can actually go and git diff things, meaning you can now find when something actually was introduced into your ecosystem. So hypothetically, you want to find out when a certain package was in, uh, involved, you just keep git diffing. Further down the line, you actually find where that package came in, you just look for the pluses, and you're good to go. Um, the interesting part of it, though, is as you continuously keep looking over and over, you can also, and kind of as this ecosystem grows out over time, you could probably actually even do things like a few years beyond because GitHub actually stores all of that data in one place. So it's version controlled, data retention, but you don't have to actually pay for it, which is awesome. Once again, comes into the shoestring budget. Now, um, what we found, honestly, was Bug Crowd produces a lot of code, which means our S bomb basically is megabytes. Um, you know, we're not like like a Microsoft, so we don't have humongous amounts of code compared, but it's still megabytes for us, meaning we have to find efficient ways to be able to go and search it, um, you know, and actually go and import all the data and utilize it uh, so that we can actually do it in things like incident response. Now, um, the advantage for us was we're a bunch of engineers, so we can actually go and just write searching scripts, and we did exactly that. We pull up the data, grab it in whatever way we need, and we can utilize it within the incident response process. Now for the actual infrastructure this is all built upon, um, it's actually done within GitHub Actions. So we're trying to keep that entire ecosystem in one place. And the good thing about keeping it in GitHub Actions is it's completely ephemeral, meaning that you know the, the uh, action spins up, it does the task, and then it dies down, and it's gone. You have nothing else to maintain. Uh, the workflows that we actually go are, yet again, version controlled, implying the entire automation is version controlled. Every single aspect of that actual bit of automation is entirely version controlled, even down to the images, and um, all that's being pulled from it is actually, once again, maintained by a reputed source like GitHub. 
So it's also looking at our own supply chain security while doing this. And also the SBOM includes the code being run inside uh, for the SBOM. So it's like, you know, looking at itself too, which is pretty fun. Um, and then finally, it also fixes a major issue around da uh, kind of data residency, where the data all stays in one single place. GitHub's data stays in GitHub, implying that it's an accepted risk already. And you don't really actually have to look beyond that, which is awesome. Now, the cool thing is this actually costs us peanuts. Um, literally, it costs us five, less than $5 a month, which, frankly, most businesses can afford. And if you can't, you should really look at your business model. That's scary. Um, but yeah, cool. Moving on. Um, we. The reality is, actually, how many people here are software developers? Can you put your hand up or has developed something? We've got a good amount. That's nice. Now, keep your hand up if you can, please. Pop your hand down if you were able to create something in a single hit and never got it wrong and didn't have to import another package. Cool. So if you actually look at it, there's not a single person who has a hand up, implying that everyone makes mistakes. And that's the reality. I come from a software engineering background. And um, yeah, basically, the reality is people make mistakes. And they install the wrong package, or they do a spike or something and realize that uh, things didn't go right. So what do you actually have to do? And the answer is SBOM for your endpoints. So not only just your code bases, not only your containers and everything running all your servers, has to be all the way down to every single laptop inside your ecosystem. And that's basically where things get very, very different, because not many people are looking at that space. So at BugCrowd, we use this tool called OS Query, which is basically creating a database out of your operating system's attributes. It goes through and runs different extensions and creates these different data points, puts it into a SQL-like database, a SQL-like -SQL database, actually. And then you can go and query it and utilize it in whatever way you need, which is awesome. Now, um, the interesting thing is OS Query itself can't be deployed without some helping tool. So you need a deployment tool to be able to go and do that. So once again, both of those are open source, which makes it cheaper for us. But instead, we go and contribute there, which you know it's a win-win for everyone. Um, the good thing is we can actually host all of this in our own AWS, and we do it for something like 200 bucks a month, uh, which is quite cheap compared to vendor tools, obviously, because you're looking at something like 30 or $50,000, depending on the size of your environment. But for us, it's scalable, and it's very easy to keep within that $200 uh, paradigm. Uh, the interesting thing is it's not only just for SBOMs. You can also use OS Query for things like insights and system performance, you know, monitoring the different processes. You could virtually turn it into a bit of an EDR tool, um, but you know, I'd recommend actually using a proper EDR for that, but whatever. Um, but the interesting thing is OS Query doesn't go all the way. It goes a certain amount of the way. It doesn't have everything built into it. Um, if you actually try to grab like Ruby packages or something like that, OS Query doesn't have that capability yet. So what we ended up doing is we wrote custom extensions on top of OS Query. And we basically deployed it into each of our different systems. And that then started feeding data back into our database. And then we were able to go and query it, grab all of these different things, and version control it accordingly. Now, the next question, uh, well, that basically actually gives us a fully dynamic SBOM. So we don't have to sit, literally, we don't pick up a single finger. Everything happens automatically, and it just feeds in the data, which means our instant response team and our SOC team can basically just sit down and go, Cool, we're ready to go. We don't need anything else. And we basically just search data. Um, now, the really interesting thing is how do you actually go and store this data when it's actually changing so rapidly and uh, it's going to cost a fair bit of money? And the short answer is um, you store it in a, you can store it in something like an S3 bucket or whatever you really want. But instead of actually storing it in such a manner, we ended up actually piping it into our scene. The reality is a scene can hold a huge amount of data. You know, it's expecting over 50 gigabytes of data a day and some pretty hectic things. So instead, what we ended up doing was piping 50 megabytes or 100 megabytes a day of just SBOM data, which is JSON, uh, parsed by the scene, into the scene, which allows for faster searching, allows for kind of version controls over the few days or years that we actually retain the data, and then we can basically go and utilize it in whatever aspect we need. So it's literally falling under your existing bills of your scene credits and whatnot. If you use Splunk, then great. You can go and literally pop it into there, and you're good to go. Um, which is a little bit of a creative way of using a seam. It's not intended, but it works really well. And once again, it's free, so even better. Um, but we've gone ahead and built SBOMs in the entire classification of like all your different uh, kind of assets there. But now we're going to talk a little bit about the actual risks. What do we actually do with all of these different assets and knowing about them? Just knowing isn't good enough. And the short answer is we can classify them into three or at least 
there's a lot of different types of risks. We're only going to talk about three. But the reality is there's risks literally everywhere. And we're going to talk a bit about all these different types. So the first one is author risk. Now, that's basically the risk of the author doing something wrong or something going wrong with the author, like directly related to said author. Now, um, the malicious push risk, at least we define it as such, is that um, an author goes and actually pushes something malicious in. Uh, and when I say pushes, I basically mean the action of introducing new code into the package, which thereby goes into the package repository, so something like PyP, and thereby propagates into every single system from there. So if it's new installations or upgrades or something like that, it's as simple as just following the ecosystem. But who's actually watching what's going on in every single package being introduced? Think about that. There's not many people actually watching it. Do you actually look at every single upgrade that's going through every single time someone goes and clicks a button and in introduces a new actual um, you know, package inside your system or upgrades it? The answer is no, no one is, or usually not. Um, on top of that, a lot of places use the at latest tag, uh, which basically just pulls the latest version of whatever package or whatever image, uh, which can thereby actually open yourself up to different types of risks. Now, moving on to actually the concept of author compromise, which is basically sometimes accounts get compromised, people get compromised, things happen. Um, so if the actual author gets compromised, what do you do? Um, you'd hope that they use something like verified commits or you know signed commits, and if they do, great, you're able to verify that it came from their system, and that means it's likely legitimate, unless their entire system got compromised. Um, reality, unfortunately, most people don't, because open source software is basically just a heroic effort. People are going and doing some epic things to make the entire ecosystem last. Now, unfortunately, since that isn't the case, we can't really go ahead and do some uh, you know that type of triage or automation to be able to go and keep this entire thing alive. Um, doing so, you basically have to keep monitoring and making sure that nothing new is being introduced. Once again, be allergic to things like um, at, least, at latest or not defining a version, especially for things like Python, uh, purely because it'll just pull the latest thing. And uh, we also wanted to give you a bit of an example of kind of what an author risk might be. Now, I'm hoping everyone's seen Shrek before, and it's like, you know, ogres have layers, onions have layers, that entire aspect. It's the exact same thing, where the, the actual author's ecosystem is a part of your ecosystem, implying that if they get compromised, you are likely going to get compromised too. It's an upstream compromise. And uh, the idea is a lot of these different authors actually go and have their own email addresses created. Um, you know, it could be custom domains or, you know, some kind of weird web server or email server. Maybe they're hosting it on the best friend's email server and they get compromised or something like that. But there's ways that it can actually upstream back up to your ecosystem and your company. So you always want to look at author risk and author reputation. Um, so, you know, hypothetically, if I had a domain and, um, you know, I accidentally let it expire, someone comes and registers the domain, pops in a new email, uh, you know, uh, email record or DNS record or something like that inside the DNS zone, then they can route all their emails. Say, if I had mine going to Microsoft, they route it to Google. They can now basically intercept all of my different emails. Then all they have to do is go to NPM or Docker Hub or something and click the forgot your password button, literally just go and get a validation link and walk into my account. Obviously, if there's MFA, things are a little bit harder, but it's not necessarily impossible. MFA bypasses exist as a vulnerability class on purpose. So um, that is a very, very significant way that things can get actually compromised, and you want to keep an eye on it. Now we're going to actually change from author risk into maliciousness risk. Now the reality is malware is out there. Um, you know, things actually are kind of going around, and people are going to continuously keep making malware. I mean, it kind of keeps our entire industry alive. Um, now the good part of it is that um, it keep, gives us jobs. The bad part of it is it makes us actually work for a living. Um, but uh, type of squatting is basically a very prominent thing in all parts of security. Um, now in this case, all you have to do is accidentally miss the UN requests and you'll go and install the wrong package. And then you accidentally basically deploy someone else's code inside your entire ecosystem and it could be game over. Uh, in that same way, we have the same general homograph attacks that you would normally see in any other place. So, you know, um, it would basically be uni using Unicode within the package names to be able to make it look different. Um, like, as you can see down the very bottom, uh, we have an example there, which is actually from a blog, where inside the blog they explain how to use Python Flask. And um, the command that they actually give you is pip install Flask. But can anyone tell the difference between the two Flasks? Yep. 
the A. Okay, you're close, but it's not only the A, it's also the S. Um, so it's the A and the S. But the reality is if you paste that into your terminal, you're probably not really actually going to see it. Um, or at least if you're trying to go fast, you're not going to realize it, especially if your terminal supports Unicode. Um, and uh, then you're just shooting yourself in the foot. But the reality is that's all you need to basically get compromised. And that's scary because your developers are going to go and read those blogs because they're actually pretty good resources too. Um, but yeah, basically now we're going to move on to the next part, which is dependency confusion, which is kind of changing a bit of tact there. But the idea of dependency confusion is basically installing different types of um, packages, which generally are supposed to be inside an internal source. So you're looking at different things like, say, from Google or something like that. Hypothetically, Google is developing their own Python packages, and they basically install from their own registry. When they go and do that, it's um, literally just going, you know, the developer's computer goes and pulls it from the registry industry and then installs whatever and does whatever they need to. Um, then uh, hypothetically, if the developer's endpoint is actually misconfigured, it'll go to the public repository first and then the internal source and then uh, basically you know, wherever it needs to go. Now, the fun thing is if it goes to the public place first and the user actually goes and registers that package and puts up a malicious package, it's game over once again. And there's actually been a lot of different examples of this. If you look at the bounty space and look at like, you know, the CrowdStream reports and stuff, you'll see a lot of different examples of uh, these different cases coming up. And it's kind of scary, but it's actually a really fun way if you actually get a chance to do it yourself, look at, you know, public code, see if anyone's got any internal package names that you can kind of go and register register it, if, uh, assuming you have permission to do this, register it and then um, you know watch them pull your own package in. And we did one recently where basically we had one and a half thousand downloads from the company and that's basically one and a half thousand endpoints compromised. And we literally just went back and said, hey, this is a P1 pay up. And they did. So it was really awesome. A very, very fun way to actually go and compromise organizations. And back to you, mate. Fantastic. So the last risk we're going to talk about is vulnerability risk, and this is probably the one we hear about all the time, and that is, did you patch your shit? Um, so have you updated your dependencies? Of course, we have talked about the dangers of updating your dependencies if you aren't you know, verifying those updates, um, but it is always good to update your dependencies because you know, those updates will fix known vulnerabilities or any CVEs that have been found in those packages. Um, and of course, there are things out there like Dependabot, uh, Dependabot is a really great tool that can, if you are using a GitHub environment, uh, can assist with um, updates. And just something to keep in mind is the safety of transitive dependencies. So we did touch on it before. Uh, essentially, transitive dependencies is a dependency um, of a dependency. Um, and of course, their compromise, uh, doesn't matter how far down the chain, is your compromise. It could lead to your compromise. And of course, that will depend on the context of how it's used. Um, but it can fully compromise an application and environment uh, often. So you know, for example, just something food for thought, imagine if the request library in Python uh, was compromised, how many different things uh, would be a compromise as a result. So just something to keep in mind when you are using dependencies, also to be thinking about the dependencies that they use. But of course, we didn't come here today without a solution. Um, so fortunately, uh, most package managers out there um, allow for things like hash integrity checks as well as version pinning. So this is a really great way to ensure that you're getting your packages from the right place uh, and that it hasn't been modified. Um, and then, of course, version pinning, you know, not using at latest on things. Um, we did see that uh, bug crowd, um, the thing found through the bug crowd platform that was done because the um, customer was using the at latest on an image, so they weren't seeing what was coming in uh, in terms of like updates to that image. And as a result, uh, they did get compromised. Uh, but of course, there are a number of different tools that you can use um, out there that are free and available to assist uh, with finding all these different, I guess, vulnerabilities and risks. Uh, a really great one is Phylum. Uh, we've been working closely with their company. They're solid people. Um, and essentially, they're a new tool geared at identifying vulnerabilities uh, and risks, particularly in software dependencies, things like outdated libraries, uh, insecure versions, uh, type scoring. They're fantastic for that. Um, there's also maliciousness risks. They've got a whole research team behind that, um, which is just fantastic. Um, we need to have OSV, uh, where you can find depths.dev. Essentially, that is a vulnerability uh, database and triage infrastructure that's really good for um, open source projects um, and finding, I guess, known vulnerabilities on there, um, or at least telling you about it. It does have an API, which is fantastic, so it means you can build some custom tooling off that. 
Uh, SEMGREP is uh, a really, really fun tool that we started using a lot. Um, if you get a chance to talk to Sarge after this talk, um, it is a static analysis tool that is used for finding bugs, uh, detecting vulnerabilities and third-party dependencies. Um, you can enforce even code standards with it. It's got a lot of granularity, which is fantastic, um, and that is also free. Um, you know, you know, you don't have to use the paywall features, um, and it does a fantastic job. Uh, there is GuardDog, that's the CLI tool that's really helpful for identifying malicious um, PyPy and NPM packages. It actually uses SEMGREP in the back end, uh, but that is a CLI tool, and as a result, you know, you can automate it and, you know, have it scanning things that you are using. And Finabot, finally, we did already talk about Dependabot. Uh, if you do want to get ahead of the curve, of course, we want to talk about threat intelligence. Um, so you can pull data from sources like GitHub advisories. Uh, essentially, it is a security vulnerability database uh, inclusive of all these different CVs um, that have been found in the world of open source. Uh, it does have an API, and it does able to identify some malware, which is fantastic. So something you can build into your tools. Phylum, uh, we did talk about them before. They are working on a threat intelligence feed, uh, so you could use them. We are thinking it's behind a paywall, but definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, in the supply chain um, area. And then, of course, custom tooling. What we recommend, uh, you, you know, you can kind of string all these different things together to build your own tools to get some threat intelligence. Uh, and as a result of all these things, you know, our SBOM, um, your hash integrity checks, version pinning, the threat intelligence, all these free tools is actually what we use, um, and it does a fantastic job for us um, at BugCrowd. Uh, so I highly recommend looking into it if you haven't, you know, dabbled too much in the supply chain area. That's your hand back to Sarge. Awesome. So basically at this point, you've gone ahead and implemented a good security standard and you actually know what you're doing, which is awesome. But the reality is you can still get compromised. And this is basically the oh shit case. Um, at some point in time, you're probably going to get popped and it's scary. Now, um, pretty much as security professionals, it's part of our kind of um, ethical obligation almost to go and have plans for things like this. It's, um, I mean, it is actually a compliance requirement. It's legislatively required too, but um, ethically, I strongly recommend doing it. Um, the idea is trying to sit down and actually go and say, okay, what do we do when something like this happens, when shit hits the fan? And uh, the reality is first always going to, and sorry, we're running out of time, so I'm going to speed run this, but we're start off with monitoring, know what, exactly what's going on. If you can, identify impact of uh, whatever is being uh, compromised, if it is actual information. And if you do uh, that kind of assessment and see it's severe enough, contain, always contain, and then try to figure out what the actual impact is. Um, something that we actually strongly recommend, and we're very lucky to have an Epic engineering team, they have everything done in infrastructure as code, which means hypothetically, if we have to rebuild our systems, it doesn't take us that long. It's like less than 10 minutes. Um, so we basically just tear out the entire um, dependency, figure out whatever is necessary, and then we basically just spin it up and go again. And so containerized, so for us, that's a win. I strongly recommend it to everyone to see if you can actually move over to something like infrastructure as code, because it will save your life. Um, now, removing from endpoints is a little bit more difficult, because sometimes uh, malware might actually backdoor into your actual operating system or screw you over in that way. And if that does happen, just removing from an MDM might not be enough. You might actually have to go and completely start cleaning things up and nuking things. So be wary of that. Um, now, very, very quickly, uh, the final part of this talk is show me the money, which is how do you actually solidify your investment? Now, it's, you know, you've done some really epic technical things. How do you actually go and uh, show them what is going on and why you're doing this? The very quick answer is that the management team needs to see the impact. They need to see why they're spending money. And um, what we've actually done at Bug Crowd is we've used our bug bounty program as a benchmark and basically said all the different risks that we identify, be it P1s, P2s, whatever, critical all the way down to informational, we give it a dollar amount in the bounty program. So we use that as an absolute minimum amount that will cost the company. Um, that way we can actually mathematically prove exactly how efficient our actual security team is. So we literally take that amount and take our salaries and then match them up and say, hey, we saved you more than our salaries, we need more investment. Trust me, you want to spend it. And we've pretty much never heard no. Um, so trust me, it works. It's really good. Uh, I strongly recommend it. And it actually shows off a competitive advantage because if you can mathematically prove your security posture, there's not many places that can actually go to that amount of maturity and basically show it off. So it's really awesome, and I strongly recommend it. Um, now, to wrap it up, we've talked about a whole bunch of different things in supply chain security, and I really hope that you get something out of it and enjoyed this talk. And we're pretty much always going to be around for questions, and you can hit us up on Twitter or something, or LinkedIn, if you do have questions, and we're more than happy to answer. Thank you.